Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, my name is Elizabeth Tyson, and I co-direct the Commons Lab at the Wilson Center. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about elephants in rooms. And I'm actually really happy that this presentation went before mine about leverage points and systems, as you are about to see. And I apologize because I'm reading notes off of my phone, so if you see me squinting, that's what's going on. Um, so what is the Commons Lab? The Commons Lab is a project that was actually founded by Leah Shanley back then, who will be speaking in the afternoon. And it is part of the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And our mission is to mobilize public participation in science, technology, and policy. And we mostly work in the fields of citizen science and crowdsourcing, which you heard a bit about yesterday. So when I was trying to come up with what to say for this presentation, I got went into a huge black hole, and I started reading a lot about Donna Meadows' leverage points in a system. How many of you guys have read this essay? Very famous essay from the 1970s. Um, she, she is awesome. <laughs> um, and she took up way too much of my time preparing for this presentation. But she wrote a famous essay in the 1970s about places to intervene in a system. She's a systems analysis. And I attempted to fit participatory science and citizen science into all these 12 leverage points because I felt um, that it is a tool for this. But then it got way too complicated and it was way too ambitious for a 10 minute speech, so I kind of gave up. But I just wanted you to know that this is what has inspired my talk. <laughs> so I kind of fell back on, um, under the theme of this conference, I am changing social and power roles in open science and open knowledge, and especially for our shared environment. I go back onto like the main concept that it are the elephants in the room that is my head, which is this myth of democracy and diversity in citizen science and crowdsourcing that we tell ourselves. It's this narrative. So I'll start kind of how I got into this field in the first place. Um, I came into it through natural resource conservation. Um, for my graduate thesis, I was down in the Sierra Madre in Chiapas in Mexico, and we mobilized Open Data Kit, which is an open source platform for um, monitoring natural resources, specifically carbon, within the UN RED framework. Are people familiar with that? Reducing emissions from deforestation, degradation. It's kind of like a global payments for ecosystem services scheme. So in my head, it kind of went, it worked like this. So we went into this community. We would offer this awesome open source tool that they could use autonomously. Um, the community monitors would monitor the carbon on their plots, and then they would use this cool new tool and share their data in the cloud, and then scientists would verify it, and then they'd be paid for the carbon um, on their plots. So in reality, it actually worked like this. Um, there was one guy in the community that knew how to navigate Google Earth, but he could not navigate the back end of the database. And this was all supposed to be very user friendly. Um, one of the monitors saw the environmental benefit in this and was really excited about it, um, particularly because he really, really loved birds. Uh, the rest of the monitors were merely motivated by the compensation that we had to provide um, to compete with the NGO rates that were going on there. Um, and Riddled was and is, uh, or sorry. <laughs> Red was and still is riddled with monitoring, reporting, and verification problems at the country level, along with corruption and protection of community rights issues and resources, and has since pulled out of Chiapas in Mexico. So the community could not and would not use this data collection system without technical help from intervening NGOs. And this myth of autonomous data collection for and by the people was sufficiently busted for me. However, there was a silver lining. The community was interested in leveraging the system for um, automating their internal control operations for coffee production. And so we kind of slapped on a couple questions about conservation at the end of this um, coffee production monitoring. And therefore, we could get some of the data that we wanted, and they could leverage this open data system with the help from NGOs. OK, after this thesis, I ran a couple citizen science projects in Oakland, California, uh, bio blitzes and air quality monitoring. And then I moved to DC to work in the Commons Lab on a more meta level. And I want to add a caveat here. There's a million assumptions I could add into this. 
um, and I don't want to be a negative Nancy about this, and I'm still in this field of citizen science and crowdsourcing because I believe in it, and I think it has potential, and I think it has promise. Um, and there are plenty of sit side projects that are working towards diversity and democracy in science, but I still have these elephants in the room that is my head, so I have to talk about them. <laughs> So who participates in citizen science and crowdsourcing projects? Has anyone here participated in a crowdsourcing project? The universe? Yeah, a couple? All right, great. So do I. Um, I have a master's degree, and I'm white, and I come from the US, and it's fun, and there's a lot of people out there like me. <laughs> um, mostly people who participate, at least in the Western world, are educated and white. Um, for crowdsourcing projects, it follows the 80-20 principle where 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. Um, usually they come to a website, and they'll do a couple tasks, and then they'll never come back. And they are students and they are scientists. This is true even in do-it-yourself bio-hacking spaces and hacking spaces. These are scientists who didn't get funding, and so they want to work on the pet project, and this is an awesome community space. And again, that's an awesome so, you know, public service, and that's good it's happening. So it's kind of like who writes the rules. Um, we think we've opened science up democratically, and we think everyone is participating, and everyone is monitoring the environment, but it's not in fact the case. And at the Commons Lab, we think a lot about these problems, and especially as we're working on a metadata standardization project. So in this project, uh, my co-director is running this. We are looking at creating a metadata schema for citizen science projects. More often than not, their data is siloed, and it's not interoperable, but if you keep, create a common metadata standard, you're able to share this data and make it more impact, impactful. However, we're writing the rules. We're creating language for this. And so we're really afraid that we're going to create a standardization that does not include everyone who is working in this space. Because a lot of the time, these projects, they don't call themselves citizen science. I think Zooniverse actually actively avoids the word citizen science. They don't call them for crowdsourcing. So, before we just set this API out there and these metadata standards, we've embarked on a stakeholder analysis. There's a bunch of citizen science associations that have formed, um, Australia, Europe, and the US. And we've asked a researcher in each node to do a stakeholder analysis of who's in the field and who's doing what. So they're going to ask people who traditionally align with citizen science what they're doing. They're going to ask people who say they're not doing citizen science, but they may be using volunteers to collect data. And we're going to see how this metadata standardization kind of affects them and how we can get around, or how we can be as inclusive as possible. So lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've been doing for the past month. And you have to excuse me because I'm a little distracted because I've been here for a month and this is the first time I've seen the sun, whether it be because of clouds or smog. So all I want to do is be outside. Um, but in Beijing, we were working with a bunch of environmental NGOs doing uh, storytelling and how to utilize citizen science in a data collection for more impactfully telling your story. Um, we worked with a bunch of NGOs from Western China and the city of Chengdu and in Beijing. Uh, we visited Brennan University and talked to them about citizen science. And we wound up at the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs. How many people are familiar with Ma Jun and all of his work? Just one? All right. Um, well, he's an awesome journalist and author, and he started this organization. And it's brought to light. It um, translates data that is usable on monitoring pollution from plants and factories. And what I found interesting, and I wanted to share this story with you because I thought this was a really amazing project, and it's actually ahead of a lot of other projects um, in Europe and the US that I'm aware of. But they are working with the Ministry of Environmental Protection there and on foul and filthy rivers. You couldn't have a better name than that. But uh, the rivers carry pollution, and they um, also carry water throughout Beijing, the city of Beijing. And they're asking the public to identify sources of pollution or take pictures of these rivers. And then this data, uh, through the blue sky map, um, which they released a while ago that uh, demonstrates this um, pollution from coal plants, this data will go straight to the Ministry of the Environmental Protection, and then they have seven days to respond to these point sources of pollution. Now, this, public, this data isn't public. Uh, they start an agreement with MEP to make it private until MEP has a chance to do something about it. Now that's extremely innovative and awesome and shows collaboration and working together. But 
I'm going to go back to the caveat of who participates. I think there's about 22,000 people who downloaded this app, and there's about 21 million people who live in Beijing. So they have a lot to go to recruit people. Um, but it's a great, it's a great start, and you guys should follow along on WeChat, which I am now on. Um, there's a lot of other awesome citizen science going on in China. Uh, I met with Green Hunan in Changsha, which does a lot of water quality monitoring. They work with families and have water quality monitoring kits that were made by Green Innovation Hub. We have someone here who represents Green Innovation Hub, and you should go talk to her and back there. Um, and I'll probably end with uh, the differences between China and the US in the questions I've gotten. Um, whenever I give presentations on citizen science and crowdsourcing, um, and a student smart audience will always ask questions about data quality. You know, how do you ensure data quality? And good question. Audience is listening to you. That's a good start. Um, but for the first time ever, uh, when I went to IP, I got the question. Uh, she stood up and she asked, how do you prevent people who participate in these projects from radicalizing, from getting angry about the environment? This wasn't how you encourage them. This was how you prevent them. So that was a very, very interesting difference. Um, and me, being American, um, I said that's that you want to radicalize them. You want to um, make them aware that there's a problem. Um, but you know, it's not going to fly. So there's there's definitely different ways that this phenomenon is manifesting itself in different countries, and it's going to be a really interesting field to follow and watch grow along with the hacker and the maker and the open science. But I think I consistently ask my, myself this question, and I want all of you to ask yourself this question, who is participating in this project, and is it really diverse, and is it really democratic? All right, thanks.